first one uh, is what's the name of the organization and website for health trend statistics that you discussed. It's the OECD, uh, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, and they're based out of uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, and they, uh, they're affiliated with the United Nations. Uh, but they're, I think, uh, governmentally different than the United Nations. Okay, embryology question for Dr. George. I'm a Chiari Searing patient, uh, and I also have a heart and chest wall neural tube defect that was present at birth. Uh, my chest wall deformity is also a connective tissue disease similar to Marfan's. My family is uh, positive for uh, MFHFR mutation and connective tissue disease. To recall, this affects folic acid B12 absorption and metabolization, uh, thus having effects on embryonic development. Uh, other patients and families stated they are positive for MTHFR. Is any present research correlation or recommendation regarding our patient population to have general screening to rule out MTHFR and other vitamin deficiencies that could affect embryonic development in general? Is there any correlation with connective tissue diseases and malformations in embryonic development? That's a big question. <clears throat> That's a great question. Um, let me just back up. Let me just say that um, when I spoke about embryology, I spoke specifically more about the bony problems. I think there's a lot of work understanding that when it comes to nervous system development, that factors that in, in, folate, in folate acid metabolism and the genes that control that can affect neural development, no question. There's no question about it. So we can see associated malformations. I sort of stayed shied away from that in the talk. Um, so you can definitely see that there may be a multiple malformations can be associated with MTHFR mutations or something else that affects folic acid metabolism or, or folic acid use. We also don't understand how folic acid contributes to what we call epigenetic phenomena. So I think there's a lot of work being done to look at folic or, or, or malformations related to folate in one way, shape, or form. So yes, there can be definitely be a relationship. Um, no one knows what it is. And yes, there's work being done for that. OK, so as far as connected tissue disorders, um, no one's really made a great, at least from a research point of view, a great connection between developmental processes and a d more of a direct link to connective tissue disorders. There's been some associations, um, clinically more so than on the research side. Um, it's just a hard thing to study on a research point of view. Uh, so I don't really have a great answer for that. Um, we've seen it clinically. We've seen some associations. I'm sure if Dr. Mayer kept going on, you would have talked about some connective tissue disorders <laughs> as far as associations. So there's been some associations, but no direct um, research done. To, to link the two. Um, but definitely for other congenital anomalies, there has been work done. Sometimes the Chiari, again, I sort of, I would classify that if, I'd, I'd put that more in the realm of, not Chiari 2, but in the realm of multiple congenital anomalies of the brain, and, and I probably would link it more to like a Chiari 2-like phenomenon. But we'd have to see. I don't, I don't have a direct answer for that. Next question was, is it possible to have syringomyelia uh, in the embryo state or to be born with syringomyelia? If so, is it possible that the nerves grow around the syrinx? Great question. Um, there are some, you know, <clears throat> in Chiari 1 malformation is so rarely diagnosed um, at birth that I really don't have that clinical question. Um, we, we haven't seen it embryologically happen. Um, usually happens later on, after not right at birth, but sometimes later on. Uh, the best we can tell is, is what we've seen. Um, even in animal models, such as uh, I showed you the sheep model, um, but that's really a different disease process. So there, since there's, there's not a great model of Chiari 1 embryologically, um, so we don't really, I can't answer that question. I can say related to, to a different category of disease, like, like neural tube defects. You can see sometimes patients born with, and even embryos have, if they have an open neural tube defect or some other true spinal cord malformation, you can see syrinx born at birth. But a QRA1, I can't answer that question, because we don't have that data. Yeah. We looked at uh, our uh, database uh, of 
basically all patients having an MRI scan, including all Chiari patients, and asked what percentage of Chiari patients at different ages have a syrinx. And for brand new babies, it doesn't address the embryo state, but for brand new babies, it was almost unheard of. We got very close to a 0% uh, coincidence of syrinx in brand new babies. And over the first four or five years of life, that rate just goes up and up and up and up to be a relatively uh, stable number uh, throughout life. Um, that doesn't mean that all syrinxes are stable throughout life, but it means that some come and some go, and the percentage stayed about the same. But at least in our data set, we weren't finding them in zero-year-old uh, patients. We were finding uh, uh, it very rarely in one-year-olds, a little less rarely in two-year-olds, and so on, and up to about four or five years where we're seeing it much more commonly. Um, that doesn't exactly address the question of embryos, but, but I think it might get close to it. Uh, how many MRIs uh, should a child and teenager get once they're diagnosed with a Chiari and syrinx? And will MRI scanning affect their body? Either of you want to tackle that? It sounds like you. <laughs> That's your dad. Well, I think uh, it depends on a lot of factors. Um, it depends if it's symptomatic, if it depends if it's going to have surgery. Um, for a child that uh, has a Chiari and syrinx and then gets surgery, I usually get an MRI scan and three months and a year postoperatively. Other surgeons have a different protocol, and that's okay. There's no, there's no industry standard that says you have to do one thing. Um, if the one-year scan looks good, I start to back off a lot. Uh, for an older individual, I don't see them very frequently from then on. I might see them once, maybe twice, depending how they're doing. Uh, assuming they're doing great, though, again, I don't see them very frequently after the one-year postoperative scan. For a very young child, which, again, is less common, uh, you see them more frequently because we know there was literature out of Boston and, and other places that have shown that if you do a Chiari decompression very early in life, it's more likely to recur. So based on those papers, I've, I've followed the very young kids more closely. With respect to does MRI scanning uh, damage uh, developing brains, I don't think there's any evidence that's ever suggested that that's the case. Anesthesia might, which is an issue that we have to consider, but the MRI scan itself does not. I Personally, I've volunteered for lots of MRI scans under the impression that I was doing myself no harm, and I'm sure lots of people uh, in the room have shared that experience. So as far as I know, we don't know of any harm that an MRI scan uh, causes. It's the anesthesia that you've got to worry about a little bit. Can I jump? Yeah, one thing. I think one, one of the harder parts is to, one of the hardest challenges is how long someone should be followed by yeah. what kind of doctor over how, what time frame and, and what age group. I think that is a big issue. I mean, as a ped pediatric doctor, I tend to follow kids for a while. Um, I think in the adult world or older kids or adult world, I think it's harder to know. I think, you know, I think, and I think it's controversial. Is it really cost effective? Can your primary doctor do the primary follow up? I think those are the questions I think we as a group of, you know, people interested in Chiari need to help recommend to the community on how, what's the best me methodology for f follow up? Who should be doing that? What things they should look for? you know, during that course. And that, that includes, therefore, that would include how many scans someone should get. We haven't come, I don't think there's a consistency with that. That's probably something we need to come up with. A question for Dr. Iskandar. Uh, would it be feasible for patients electing to undergo Chiari surgery to donate their surgical tissue for research, such as the cranial tissues or dura, uh, to be used in any way? Right, it's not the lack of people willing to do it, in fact, I would say I haven't met anyone who wouldn't be willing to donate because everybody has that concern. Is it going to happen to my children? How can I avoid it? Uh, the problem is funding. It's the funding agencies that drive the research. It's the funding agencies that will tell the researchers, no, you cannot have a tissue bank because it's going to cost us a lot of money and, and we're not going to see immediate results. These are the results we might see in 10 years, and we're not interested in funding that. That's where the problem lays. It's not the lack of people who are willing to donate their tissue. Is CSF fluid analysis, uh, such as you discussed, a routine procedure after surgery? And also, is recording opening pressure as a routine procedure at surgery? I would say no. I, don't, yeah. I think it would be a very unusual procedure. Uh, why do some symptoms improve with surgery and others do not? Do you think it has to do with how long the Chiari was there? 
So <laughs> that's a big question. So like with anything, if you look at medicine in general, the first thing is the indication for surgery. If you do surgery on someone who doesn't need it, he's not going to improve. That's number one. So there, there is a spectrum, there's a gray zone of what the symptomatic states of Chiari's are. And if you consider that in neurology there are only about 30 symptoms we talk about, but they're shared among hundreds of diseases, you can imagine it's just about anything is seen with Chiari patients. So first and foremost is operate on the right patients. Make sure the symptoms are related, and oftentimes that it's not very easy to tell. After that, we still have failure rates. Some of them are due to inadequate decompression. Others are due to some instability that uh, was not too obvious early on. Others might be due to uh, intracranial pressure problems, but I, I agree with Cormac that that's rare. Uh, so, uh, but I would say that the majority of failures, at least in the adult population, are related to surgery that probably uh, was, uh, you know, or symptoms that are probably unrelated to the, to the right. original problem, the Chiari problem. Right, I mean, essentially, three possibilities, right? Yeah. The, the it was improper diagnosis that the symptoms were in fact not being caused by the thing that we were operating on, uh, that we did the improper operation or yeah. didn't, do it, uh, didn't do it well enough, uh, or that just the surgery was not capable of making that better, even yeah. if there was a relationship there. Um, I, I always worry uh, about surgical failures. I think there, there are people out there that have had a, an unsuccessful result from surgery that can get better with a, a second better operation. But I think for everybody that, that I meet like that, there's somebody who's had five unsuccessful operations. And I think at that point, as, as a surgeon, I think it's unlikely that I'm going to make it better with a sixth operation. Napoleon uh, had a phrase that I think about sometimes when he was, uh, I think it was Waterloo, he was losing the battle and some, one of his adjutants had sent in the reinforcements on this wing. And, and he said, well, I never like to reinforce failure. Um, and uh, I think if, if somebody has tried a Chiari decompression and presumably done a pretty good Chiari decompression, um, if, if I can find some obvious reason to think that it wasn't done well or the patient has a pseudomeningocele, okay, then we can talk about how maybe surgery can help the next time. But I think barring one of those obvious reasons, it's, I think we have to entertain the possibility that a Chiari decompression didn't work because a Chiari decompression is not going to work. And it depends on the symptoms. Yesterday in the pain lecture, uh, it was obvious that uh, you know, some of the adults who've had pain for 20 years and then had a Chiari decompression, it's unlikely for that pain to resolve. But if you take a 10-year-old who has you know, tons of headaches, it's unlikely that it won't resolve. So it, it also depends on the type of symptom and how long it's been there. Question for Dr. George, can you tell if an embryo or fetus has a Chiari before birth? And if yes, what tests can be done to tell? Yeah. Um, it is possible to diagnose a Chiari before birth. If you get a late, particularly in the late second to third trimester to do a, like a fetal MRI scan, ultrasounds are not great to show it because they don't visualize the posterior fossa very well. Um, but it's possible to see it. Um, I don't know what that would mean because, you see, as you've heard in data, that because someone, so let's define Chiari. I mean, embryologically, I define it by being an abnormality of the, the bones of the posterior fossa, frame, and magnum, not necessarily the degree of tonsil herniation. However, if you do see it, you may find it, and what does it mean is a whole separate question, right? How do you deal with it? What does it mean? I think you can probably find it. You can find it early on in life, but it varies, as you've heard from Dr. Mayer's data, that it can vary over age. It can progress, it can change. Even if you're born with it, it may vary. I've seen kids get better, I've seen kids get worse over time. So the meaning of it is harder, it's probably the hardest part of that interpretation. But can you see it? Yes. What do you do about it? I wouldn't recommend fetal surgery for uh, uh, any sort of tonsil ectopia or tonsil herniation we see. Or, of whatever degree, and even early on in life, it's you know unless someone has 
something that I really that we really could say had symptoms and in most infants and young kids is going to be some brainstem problem they can't breathe or can't do something like this then it'd be hard to even validate or justify to do something about it so I'm not sure yes you could probably make the diagnosis what it means though I think we have no idea so a question for both of you regarding research what uh, actions can the Chiari and syringomyelia community take to push for more research is there a way for our uh, is there a way for us to push our government and organizations for more research funding? Call your local representative, senator, um, congressman. <laughs> uh, I'll be totally honest with you. I mean, I've seen um, in like a great uh, example. I sat on a Washington committee for brain tumor, for pediatric brain tumors, and one of the areas was in trying to develop funding or, or try to incentivize companies to produce drugs specifically for pediatric tumors. The reason why that's important is that very few of the companies, because in the big picture, pediatric brain tumors are very dangerous for the pediatric population. But across the country, they're very rare as far as if you look at all the patients with cancer, right? Reality of it is only a couple percent of the population that, have, that are kids. So no company, and most people don't want to, even the researchers don't want to necessarily, even research groups don't necessarily want to put monies behind something that in the big picture may not have a big impact or very rare. So we sat on a committee to push those things. So it, it does take raising it up to show that it's very important. And, uh, that's, a, and that's gonna take a group of people who are organized and, and, uh, and have drive to, to really contact the politicians to help drive particularly federal funding. Other non-federal funding sources, um, such as your organization already actually helps fund, like for instance, this study, or at least help you know, fund studies like this. So some of it comes from the private sector, lobby local communities, local businesses to help generate funding. That's another way to get research done too in today's world. It doesn't have to come from federal funding alone. But that is a great source of funding, the federal source. Yeah, the, the Hydrocephalus Association has been able to do this, to lobby the, uh, the federal government to, to provide more funding. Uh, it's different when it comes from a life-threatening disease. I mean, Chiari, by definition, is not really a life-threatening disease, so that's going to be, uh, it's not like cancer, it's not like hydrocephalus, so you're, you'll have more difficulty pushing the government to do that. However, now we're recognizing that Chiari is not a rare disorder, and by it being a common disorder, potentially, you might have better luck, uh, or we might have better luck uh, pushing some more uh, you know, funding to go, go through. But I agree with, with Tim, a lot of the really good research started was in small communities and by small private organizations like this one. And so I think the money would be to try to be not just picky about the research that you fund, but go seek out people who are really good researchers and see if they're interested in, in switching to Chiari research. That, that's, I think, where the money is going to be. Another question is, are children who are symptomatic from a very young age likely to have worse long-term outcomes? Um, I, I can start. I, I think not necessarily. I mean, we see patients uh, who are diagnosed uh, early that have uh, typical symptoms and have significant uh, syrinx in their spine uh, and uh, can do very well from surgery and go on to have essentially completely normal lives. Uh, so I think that that's, that's not only possible, but probable. It's the most frequent outcome that we see. Um, so. Uh, I think the answer to your question is no, not necessarily. I think uh, being symptomatic early just means you're symptomatic early um, and uh, you have to go through uh, an intervention earlier in life, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your life is guaranteed to be worse. I agree 100%. I think most of the kids I see, the younger ones tend, you know, you diagnose them at a reasonably young age, so, you know, they actually do well, particularly less than 10, they actually do well for years and do very well. So I think that the trend is that they do better, that they do do work very well, no question. Okay, there's a number of questions which, which I'm going to try to combine uh, that get at uh, the relatively interesting issue about what we really should call this thing, that we all call Chiari <laughs> malformation. 
Um, Dr. Dr. George uh, talked about that a little bit uh, in his comments this morning, pointing out that a number of us don't even like the fact that it's called Chiari, because Hans Chiari, when he defined it, um, it, it was nice that he put a name on it and, and kind of got the ball rolling. But on the other hand, if you read his original uh, description, he got an awful lot of things essentially wrong, or at least was talking about a different thing than what we're talking about now in this room. Uh, so should we, should we really be crediting him with this and naming this after him when he wasn't really talking about what we're talking about? It used to be called Arnold Chiari, which we've all kind of gotten rid of the word Arnold because Arnold definitely didn't deserve to be on that. But even Chiari is, is a little bit of an interesting question. And then malformation, is it a malformation? Well, I think a, a number of people think probably not. It's not a brain malformation, just like Dr. George was saying. In most cases, Chiari 1, Chiari 2 can be a brain malformation, but Chiari 1, in most cases, is not a brain malformation. We think that most likely it's a normally formed brain that has a, a abnormal relationship with the skull and with the spinal canal, but there's really no evidence that the brain is, is malformed. So should we call it Chiari? Should we call it malformation? I think those are interesting questions. Um, and other than saying I agree that they're bad names, really there's not been any great solution put forward that everybody's latched onto. There was a, a paper a few years ago in Journal of Neurosurgery which suggested we should call it an anomaly rather than a malformation. And it seemed like a good idea to me, but it didn't get any traction. Uh, so we're left with calling it Chiari malformation. The, <clears throat> the next set of questions get at the issue of whether we should call it a disease or a disorder. And, I don't want to speculate too much, but it, reading these questions, it seems like this person feels very strongly uh, that it should be called one or the other. Uh, and I have to say my personal opinion is that I don't have a strong opinion if we want to call it a disease or a disorder as long as we know what we're talking about, that we're talking about the same thing. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's probably not a place I want to devote a lot of energy to making sure it's called a disease or making sure it's called a disorder. We're talking about the same thing. We're researching the same thing. We're operating on the same thing. And I, I personally don't see how it's one or the other. I spent quite a lot of time in my talk discussing what we call disease. Do we call asymptomatic patients diseased or not? I mean, that's philosophy. That's disease nosology. You could write books about that, not even with respect to Chiari, with respect to anything. Um, and again, that, that answer is not something that we can all agree on scientifically and put a stamp on it and send it out into the world. We, we just all have to, I think, have this dialogue and come to some conclusion. So yeah, I call it a disease. Chiari, I call it a disease. Do I feel very strongly that people who call it a disorder are wrong? Uh, not really. I mean, I frankly don't see how it changes much for the way I think about Chiari. Uh, having said that, that's my little editorial. I'm interested yeah, to hear uh, what your perspectives are. I have a bias, so I will make push back. I'll say, you know, um, from a practical point of view, if a disease can be something that disturbs your ease, mm -hmm. and I think that we're, we, we've seen things that are structurally or morphologically or by picture that may look abnormal, but does it disturb your ease? Most often, so if we, if, I'm a little biased by saying if we call it a disease, then we're saying it dis, it's, it's disturbing your ease or your functionality. And we have no, and as you see, what, 1% or less than 1%, 1 in 10,000 or less may actually have a disturbance of their ease based on a structure. And as a developmental biologist, I can say I can find a birth defect on every human being in this room, okay, um, ranging from, you see mine. I have a little black mole there. That's one. Of, just one of them. So with that, is Cindy Crawford made a million dollars off of hers. I haven't gotten. A, I haven't gotten a penny from mine. Yet. I don't know why. I haven't figured that out. But that's a malformation of cells that shouldn't be there. It grows hair, so I have to cut it once in a while. So what happens? So that's a malformation, right? It's a disorder, from that point of view. But does it bother me? Is it a disease? So I don't think so. So I just want to put my editorial in by saying that, so my editorial, I'm not disagreeing. Well, I am disagreeing well, a little bit. But my editorial is that I think that we will have to sooner or later, up front, I don't care what we call it either. But I think in the thinking process of it, we probably have to separate a little bit of what we see structurally. Everyone may have, a, as well as I sort of said, we all develop pretty well. But everybody has some abnormality within how well we develop. We're all different. We all have little variations. Those variations we see, and they don't necessarily mean they're disturbing our functionality. So I think we will have to somehow come to what is a variation of development, 
versus, and maybe structure versus something that's bothering us. And I think that's my only. Yeah, and, and I completely agree with those comments. I mean, I, I like your definition of disease. It's a good definition of disease. It, it doesn't quite cover what we're doing in modern medical practice, though, where no. a large part of my practice, a large part of your practice is seeing patients and interpreting studies when people feel okay. Mm -hmm. And we have to assign them an ICD-9 code, now an ICD-10 code, with their disease diagnosis, and the insurance company has to pay and, uh, based on their disease diagnosis. So I think that's what we're, we're calling we're struggling it. with, right. And uh, again, I think it's a, it's a real struggle to come to terms with this. And does it really change anything? I, I'm not sure. I want to hear from Dr. Iskandar and get his answer. But as, as part of your answer, I've had a follow-up to that question, uh, which is, does what we call it uh, make a difference uh, for funding uh, and uh, protocols, doing scientific uh, work with with trying to find answers and solutions. My own perspective is, is no, it really doesn't. Um, so again, I think if it did make a big difference, then I would feel more strongly about it. But I can't think that it makes any difference at all right now. Yeah, I would, uh, just a brief comment that when we write a paper, the last thing we write is the title. We can't figure out what the title is gonna be until we figure out what the results are. So until we really study this phenomenon that we call Chiari, thoroughly understand the pathophysiology, understand what it means and how it develops, we're not gonna know what to call it. So you might as well just call it what we're calling it now, uh, work on the fundamental issues to try to define it, and maybe in 50 years someone will come say, well, it's logical, this is what needs to be named. That'd be my opinion. Okay. We have uh, just a couple of questions that, that seem like very good and important questions. They deal very specifically uh, with with individual patients. So I think I'm going to, rather than ask them exactly the way they were asked, I'm just going to ask the open-ended question. Uh, when somebody uh, has a, a Chiari that you feel like is symptomatic, somebody maybe has a Chiari that's associated with a syrinx and symptoms, um, does age matter for you, uh, and especially at the older end of the age range? Uh, is there ever an age that you would say surgery is not appropriate? For me, the answer would be no. I think if somebody had clear symptoms and, uh, and a syrinx uh, and they were healthy enough to withstand surgery, then I don't think there's an upper age limit. We, you're talking to three pediatric neurosurgeons. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess we, you know, I think you can have some inherent bias within that. Um, I, I agree with, with what Dr. Mayor said. We think that 18 is old. Right, yeah. <laughs> so above 18, you may be on your own anyway. So that's a whole other story. Um, so that's what I said, with, with some bias. I do think that um, what we don't know, and to really answer that question well, I think we, I think again, I'll approach it from a developmental point of view. We know kids up until, from zero up until maybe 20-ish, are still developing. You get to be 20-ish to 50-ish, whatever, you sort of plateau, and, and then later on you start to degenerate. You know, so I would say that we haven't been, if we had a great way of mapping out the natural process of life, <laughs> then we, we would understand how to best target treatments, especially treatments that, you know, that may be tricky. I think part of the bias is how, what's the risk of surgery? I think fortunately most time QRI malformation surgery is not terribly risky compared to some other surgeries, but it can have problems, don't get me wrong. It's not terribly risky, so you can use that as a part of the formula. Sure. Um, but I would say that, you know, from my point of view, uh, there's, I don't have an age cutoff. I like to have a relative idea on how healthy the person is, how active the person is, and uh, before I would say you should be treated or not. But I, I would probably bias it by saying the older you are, I'd probably say your outcome is probably not going to be overall as good as somebody who's younger. There's going to be a trend in that. I would add to this that it's difficult for me to conceive that a 60-year-old, previously not symptomatic, comes in with sudden Chiari symptoms. That's not something that I can imagine would happen. Now, there are some who've had symptoms for 30 years and not been treated, and yes, maybe these would, would uh, 